hear me. So distinguished guests and esteemed panelists, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, or good night, depending on where you are joining us from. Welcome to this important session on promoting the digital emblem. I am Michael Karamian, Director of Digital Diplomacy for Asia and the Pacific at Microsoft, and I have the privilege to serve as moderator today. In today's digital age, the concept of the digital emblem represents a critical innovation uh, in humanitarian protection. Much like the Red Cross, Red Crescent, and Red Crystal emblems have safeguarded lives during times of conflict in the physical world, the digital emblem aims to extend these protections into the digital realm. It is intended to be a symbol of hope and security, ensuring that medical and humanitarian entities can continue their life-saving work without the fear of malicious cyber operations. Importantly, the digital emblem concept is an acknowledgement of the evolving nature of warfare and conflict, where cyber operations play an increasingly impactful and harmful role. It emphasizes the criticality of upholding the principles of international humanitarian law in the digital space, where the consequences of attacks on hospitals and humanitarian organizations can be just as devastating as physical assaults. Our esteemed panel of experts today will delve deep into the technical, legal, and humanitarian aspects of the digital emblem. They will explore how it can be developed, deployed, and upheld, ensuring that it becomes a recognized symbol of protection in an increasingly digital yet vulnerable world. As we embark on this discussion, it is important to recognize that the digital emblems has profound importance. It not only signifies a collective commitment to safeguarding the vulnerable, but also highlights the intersection of technology, cybersecurity, and humanitarian protection. Through this dialogue, we aim to advance our understanding, share insights, and collectively work toward a more secure and resilient digital future. So let us begin this exploration into the digital emblem concept, its significance, and the path forward. Together, we can hopefully promote digital peace and protect those who need it most. To help us achieve that goal, I am pleased to say that we are joined by Felix Linker, researcher at ETH Zurich, who joins us online. Dr. Antonio De Simone, Tony to friends, uh, chief scientist at Johns Hopkins Applied Physics Laboratory, who also joins us online. Francesca Bosca, chief of strategy and partnerships at the Cyber Peace Institute, who's also joining us online. And in person, we are joined by Koichiro Komiyama, director of the Global Coordination Division at JPCERT, and also affiliated with APCERT, and Mauro Vignetti, advisor on digital technologies of warfare at the ICRC. So to help set the scene, Mauro, please let's begin with an overview of the digital emblem. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Michael, and everyone. So I, I'm gonna give an overview about the, the emblem, uh, also the physical one, just to uh, bring everybody at the same speed uh, uh, by discussing the digital emblem. So the Red Cross, Red Crescent, and uh, more recently the Red Crystal, have been symbols of protection, so meaning that facilities, uh, people, vehicles, uh, showing this emblem should not be attacked, they should be spared by the consequences of uh, armed conflict. So uh, this is why uh, the international humanitarian law requires part of the conflict uh, to ensure the visibility of the emblem so that combatants can identify the persons and the objects that they must protect and respect. And we're gonna see that this is a, a very important uh, aspect uh, also in the digitalization of the emblem. So the rules on the use of uh, the distinctive emblems or signals are governed in the Annex 1 of the first additional protocol uh, of the Geneva Conventions of 1977. So, and there is an article, it's an article, it's the Article 1 of the Annex that mandates the ICRC uh, to see whether uh, new systems or identification should be adopted. And that's why we're here to discuss the project of the digital emblem because we think it's fundamental to have a digital version of the emblem. So the emblem mark medical personnel, medical unit, and vehicle, and, uh, and, uh, and organization like the Red Cross and the Red Crescent uh, organization. So, and there are two uses of the emblem. So there, are, uh, there is the distinctive use of the emblem, so, so to say it's always on, in the way that uh, organizations like the International Committee of the Red Cross and the National Societies can use the emblem at, at all time. And then there is another use of the emblem that is the protective use. This means that uh, uh, mm, selected, dedicated uh, entities can use the emblem only during armed conflict. This is also a very important point because the emblem, also in the digital space, must be flexible 
uh, in this respect and, uh, and use only uh, during armed conflict. So that said, so it's a general review about the emblem and, uh, and we're gonna go into the detail why we need uh, to digitalize uh, the emblem to have a, a digital version of it. Thank you. Thank you, Mauro. So today's session will have three segments. For approximately 30 minutes, our speakers will frame the discussion from their perspectives. We'll then spend approximately 20 minutes with the speakers having a conversation among themselves on the technical, legal, and humanitarian aspects. And we aim to dedicate 30 minutes for audience Q&A, so please start to think of your questions now. In terms of framing the discussion, Francesca will turn to you first, and it'll be great to have your overview of the CPI's role in protecting vulnerable entities in cyberspace, overview of the trends in healthcare, uh, sorry, cyber attacks against hospitals and medical facilities, including in times of conflict, and also importantly, the role of neutral organizations in promoting digital peace. So Francesca, over to you. Thank you so much, Michael. And it's a pleasure to be here with you all. Uh, can you see my screen? We can, thank you. Great, thank you. Um, so um, thanks a lot, um, Mauro, for the uh, excellent introduction in um, framing the discussion around the digital emblem. Let me take a step back or better uh, to, to um, share uh, some reflections on the work that we've been doing at the Cyberbase Institute, specifically to understand uh, the context of uh, the, um, the, the why it's so important uh, to um, protect uh, civilian infrastructure like, like the healthcare sector and humanitarian organizations, both in peacetime and uh, during armed conflict. So um, let me um, share uh, some uh, also um, some reflections on how the Cyber Business was created and is operating to try to understand uh, um, some of the considerations that I hope uh, will uh, will help the discussion further. So recognizing that our um, uh, digitizing societies and partic are particularly vulnerable to cyber attacks and often lack the resources to strengthen their cybersecurity, the Cyber Peace Institute was, uh, was founded in 2019 um, in response to the um, escalating dangers posed by sophisticated cyber attacks. Um, the, the mission, uh, the overarching mission of the Institute uh, is to mitigate the adverse effects uh, of cyber attacks on people's lives worldwide. Uh, this is extremely important because this will bring us to the focus of the Institute, which is to understand um, the human impact of cyber attacks. Um, we accomplish this uh, through key synergistic pillars that you can see here. So first, we uh, I, we aid uh, vulnerable communities to stay safe in cyberspace, uh, focusing especially on vital sectors, as mentioned, like healthcare, nonprofit, and humanitarian organizations. Second, uh, as you might see, we conduct investigation and analysis on cyber attacks. Our cyber threat analysis team has been focusing on cyber attacks uh, against the healthcare since uh, 2020 and uh, since uh, February 2022. Uh, specifically on cyber attacks uh, in the context of armed conflict. Now we are building the same capability to monitor attacks against uh, NGOs, including humanitarian ones. Then we advocate for improved cybersecurity standards and regulations with evidence-based knowledge, and we complete, let's say, the, the cycle uh, by proactively addressing also the emerging technological challenges and disruption to the work of humanitarian organizations caused, for example, by artificial intelligence or quantum computing. I wanted to explain this to, to understand also, I mean, how we came about, let's say, the, the analysis that uh, um, I'm gonna offer some insight today for further discussion. Um, all the um, information and specific data are available on our, on our website and our different platform. Um, as, as mentioned, I mean, uh, when we think about the healthcare sector, um, what we did at the Institute was that amid the pandemic, we focused on uh, um, our work aimed by um, supporting the so-called the most vulnerable, specifically on the unique vulnerabilities of the healthcare sector and the real impact uh, of the increasing numbers of cyber attacks against it. And uh, we, and, and you can see um, that uh, we uh, created a, a fairly unique platform that is called the Cyber Incident Tracer Health. And the platform serves to document uh, um, cyber attacks um, and not only to, you, you will find the, let's say, the numbers 
in terms of like uh, um, data collection, but also try to understand the, which are the criteria, which are the metrics that are relevant to understand the real impact that they have on people. So you will see how many attacks per week, so the total record breach, how many countries, but also you will find what it means in terms of, for example, how many days of disruption in hospital and medical facilities, how many people could not get the vaccines because um, a certain facility was uh, was attacked, how many people could not get uh, the proper care, um, how many ambulances were directed. Um, in, in, in total, I mean, and just to, to give an idea, this has led to the, the breach of over uh, 21 million patient records, which has leaked or exposed in 69% um, of the incident. Um, again, the important aspect is that disruption to patient care endanger lives and create the stress and suffering for patients and medical professionals. Uh, and, and on the long term, it also erodes the trust in healthcare providers. Um, we apply the same capability, we're currently applying the same capability also to um, uh, assess uh, cyber attacks in terms of uh, uh, what is happening uh, um, when uh, civilian infrastructures are attacked during armed conflict. Again, no need to, to stress it again, but cyber, uh, cyberspace is borderless, and so cyber operations go well beyond the belligerent countries to hit critical infrastructure and populations, also in third countries. Um, we have to consider the anonymity of the digital world, so the actors involved in cyber warfare are numerous and diverse, and their true intention are even, in, are even more complex, let's say, to define and predict. And again, cyber operations have a significant uh, um, human impact on population living in conflict. Um, they are threatening crucial services. Healthcare is a good example, and also other um, uh, um, civilian infrastructure areas. And also there are, let's say, kind of like a very peculiar dimension about the, the um, uh, let's say, the digital space, and this is why the emblem is so important. Uh, for example, the spread of this information can make it harder to distinguish between fact and fiction, both inside and outside countries in conflict. Um, I, I would like to um, basically to, to, to stop here, uh, maybe sharing this uh, first uh, insights, and uh, we can uh, um, possibly continue the, the discussion further. Thank you so much, Michael. Francesca, thank you very much, and absolutely we can come back to more of these topics in the discussion later on. I think, if anything, the pandemic showed in a perverse way that with the severe vulnerability of the healthcare sector, there is a need for this sort of uh, collective action together, and hence the, the importance of the ICRC's leadership in this space. Now, moving on, Koichiro, it'll be great to have a presentation from you or to hear your thoughts on the cybersecurity challenges in Asia and the Pacific, and the insights that you might have into the evolving threat landscape, and of course, the importance of global coordination. Uh, uh, thank you, Mike, and uh, good morning, everyone. My name is Kochiro Spaki Komiyama from Japan Third and AP Third. Uh, I think uh, in this session, I like to represent the technical comi technical community in uh, in this region, Asia Pacific. Um, I've been working for for uh, um, on the ground incident response for uh, for like dozens of years. And I'm also a, a scholar uh, for international relations and uh, related area. So from my perspective, uh, I'd like to uh, share with you a few things. First of all, in, in Asia, uh, you know, states are racing for uh, expanding capacity of offensive side, capacity and capability of offensive side of their cyber uh, C cyber cyber uh, capabilities, um, and for instance, uh, UK think tank IISS recently published a report on the the cyber power of major tw twenty major states, and um, quite a few. Uh, some of Asian uh, countries are ranked as, uh, for example, Australia, China. They are the tier two countries. Where only we have, where we have only only one tier one country, United States. So uh, we have major two two major players in in Asia, and for tier three we have India, Indonesia, Iran, Malaysia, North Korea, Vietnam. They are all, well, by uh, assessment from uh, independent think tank, they are 
uh, you know, uh, they are, they, they have well-established offensive cyber capabilities. So there's a, there's an urgent need for country like Japan to uh, to de-escalate this uh, this I know the, the loop of uh, militarization of uh, cyberspace, and then uh, talking about Japan itself, uh, we have been refraining go offensive. I mean, our mainly due to the, our peace constitution prohibit us to. Uh, to use use the force, uh, use of force, um, except the case it is recognized as a, a part of collective defense. So um, historically, uh, we do not have, and we did not try to equip offensive cyber capability, but that has been changed, that was changed December last year, with new national security strategy. Japan also, uh, seeking to to have a uh, offensive or well, in in other in other in our wording it is a uh, active cyber defense, not offensive, uh, but it, well there's a subtle difference, but anyway it's a it's not something we haven't we haven't do or we haven't even try for last 50, 50 years. And uh, my last point is, uh, we see many damages caused by ransomware attack, and most of those, uh, you know, they are mostly uh, driven by a commercial or profit. So they are hack, they, uh, they launch ransomware attack uh, for, uh, for, for profit. Now, uh, for last 12 months, we see many uh, success or, uh, successful breach to our hospitals, uh, one of our uh, you know, very critical infrastructure. However, uh, they are usually very slow in protecting their own network. You know, um, and going back to the, the emblem, uh, of course, I know it's not for, you know, it, it, it doesn't, have any direct effect to criminals in a peacetime, of course. However, you know, having this type of document and guideline, I expect that some pr they can also put some pressures on criminal groups uh, on what they can do, they, what they cannot do. Uh, th they cannot do in a uh, for, for 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 their uh, for their operation. So that's my initial contribution, and uh, happy to discuss with you uh, for further details. Thank you. Kojiro, thank you very much. And interesting to hear you reference uh, the intention for Japan to uh, introduce active cyber defense as part of the new national security strategy. Of course, different actors always define active cyber defense in different ways. It'll be interesting to see how Japan approaches it in line with responsible behavior in cyberspace norms and the pacifist constitution. Mara, returning to you, it'll be helpful to hear more on the ICRC's role in researching and developing the digital emblem, the importance of addressing uh, the need for extending international humanitarian law into cyberspace, and the in insights that you might have on the application of the digital emblem in practice. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, so, Michael, you, uh, you and Francesca, you mentioned the pandemic. Uh, so, this is exactly the point in 20, 2020 when we start to uh, think about the digitalization of the emblem by observing what was happening uh, during 2019 uh, uh, in the pandemic time, and but also uh, observing what is happening during armed conflict. So that's the period we start to research the possibility to digitalize the Red Cross, uh, Red Cross and Emblem to signal the protection against cyber operations for medical facilities and, uh, and the uh, uh, Red Cross and Red Crystal organizations. So to start the project, we define some technical aspects that the emblem should uh, should have, a, a potential digital emblem should have. So these are the requirements that, uh, that we define. So first one was uh, it must be easy to deploy. So we know that uh, during armed conflict, it's always difficult to find, uh, uh, it's, it's already difficult the situation in armed conflict, but it's also difficult to find IT personnel that is uh, able to uh, to work in, in, this, in this domain. So 
the Yaml must be very easy to uh, to deploy, like the physical one, also the digital one must be easy to deploy. So it must be able to be installed on a number of different devices. That's uh, that's uh, a, a very important uh, aspect because we know that, uh, for instance, medical devices, they cannot be modified because of different reasons, the guarantee, the functioning of medical devices. So we have to find a way to put the emblem on those devices without touching them, without installing anything on those devices. So we do not have to generate costs for uh, for the entities that are showing uh, the emblem. So if we think a medical unit, a doctor that has to show the emblem, he has not to have a related cost to, uh, to uh, deploy and show the emblem. And my most importantly, he has to be seen and understood. So the logic of the emblem is from the perspective of the attacker. So when we have an operator running a, a cyber operation, he has to, uh, they have to understand uh, um, that they are confronted with an emblem and they have to be able to recognize this is the emblem of the Red Cross Red Crescent. So, and they have to understand this emblem and they have to be able to also check the authenticity of the emblem, not that it's a, a fake emblem, but uh, it is uh, an original one. And uh, another um, aspect uh, is the, the emblem should be uh, used by state and non-state actors. So we see uh, many state actors also involved in, in conflict. So not only thinking about states able to deploy the emblem, but also by non-state actors. So um, on that, uh, we are seeing some challenges in deploying this. First of all, and I think it's uh, one of the most important challenges that uh, we don't have an internet for armed forces and we don't have an internet only for civilians. So the infrastructure is mixed, the nature of internet is mixed, and, uh, and that's why we need uh, a digital element that uh, can go granular on identifying assets on network because the network are intermingled and uh, we cannot divide. So mm, I'm thinking about cloud infrastructure, satellite infrastructure and so on. So we can have a doctor that has a computer that should be protected with the emblem that is used in a military network that is a, uh, is a, is a target. So we, can, we have to think in those scenarios. And then, uh, so the challenge is also the medical devices I mentioned before. And then uh, the environment, so it's very complex, fluid, dynamic field. So we, we have a very um, stressful situation in armed conflict. So we have to be aware of this. And the, that's why the emblem must, and the digital emblem must adapt to this kind of, uh, of field. So that's why we uh, um, start to, uh, to, uh, to talk with uh, John Hopkins University that uh, we're gonna have uh, uh, later on uh, in this panel and with uh, ATHZ uh, um, and, uh, and the University of Bonn as a center for cyber trust. And we start to talk with them and they start to develop a potential uh, a way to digitalize uh, the emblem. Then we consulted uh, during, the, during the last year 44 experts from, from 16 countries. And uh, we submitted the, the, the ideas that uh, have been developed so far. And they identify benefits and risks in, uh, in, uh, in digitalizing the ML of the Red Cross. So among the benefits, uh, logically, the digital ML will extend the existing protection from the physical space to the digital world. So this is a, a very positive aspect. Uh, and uh, they m the AMLA will make it easy for operators to avoid arming protected entities. So th th those are the main uh, benefits uh, resulting from the consultation, but also the risks. So we risk, based on the expert consultation, to increase visibility of sensitive and less protected entities like hospitals. Knowing that uh, all the experts reflect on that, saying that uh, nowadays it's already there, e there are already multiple several possibilities to identify uh, less protected entities, uh, scanning the internet, finding out who, uh, which IPs, which domain names belongs to hospitals. So in their opinion, we are not uh, aggravating the situation, we are not increasing because there are already methods and means to identify those, but uh, we have to keep in mind that uh, putting an emblem on something, someone, an object is could be putting a target uh, on, 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 on a personal object if the, uh, the parties do not respect the emblem. And then the, uh, as, a, as a second big risk is the possible misuse. So we know in the physical world there are several cases of misuse of the emblem. 
Um, we're going to see uh, uh, with the presentation uh, fr from the two universities that uh, we can reduce in the digital space uh, the possible misuses through the technology that they are developing. So this is uh, a positive uh, development uh, in, in this respect. So we published the first report in November last year. So if you are interested uh, on the website of the ICC, you're going to find the report. So this is generally how uh, the genesis of, of the project on digital energy. Thank you very much, Mauro. And you mentioned the role uh, or the issue surrounding non-state actors. During the Q&A, perhaps we can discuss ICRC's recent principles on uh, non-state actors. I know a, a question has already been posed uh, on the Zoom platform. I encourage more questions as well, and of course, encourage the audience to think about their questions uh, when we come to the Q&A portion later on. Felix, turning to you, uh, ETH Zurich, it'll be tremendous to hear your thoughts on the technical solution of the Center for Cyber Trust to implement the digital emblem, uh, your thoughts on the feasibility and design considerations, and any insights that you might have on the role of technology in protecting medical and humanitarian organizations. Felix, over to you. Thank you for a great introduction, Michael, and also thank you to the other speakers for setting the floor so well. So as Mauro said, we were contacted by the ICRC in 2020, and in response to their question of um, how a digital emblem could work, we developed a system that we call ADEM, which stands for an authentic digital emblem. And in the next minutes, I would like to give you an overview of the key design concepts that went into ADEM. So uh, first, Mauro mentioned it, uh, um, Emblem must be verifiably authentic. We looked at this problem more generally and asked ourselves the question, when is the digital emblem trustworthy? And we identified three security requirements in response to that. So, as I said, an emblem must be verifiably authentic. That means parties who observe an emblem can um, check that it is legitimate and develop trust in the emblem itself. Second, a digital emblem must provide accountability. As Mauro said, there can be misuse, but we designed our digital emblem in such a way that whenever parties misuse it, they, um, they commit to irrefutable evidence that could be admitted to court, for example, to prove that they misbehaved and to hold them accountable for that misbehavior. And finally, attackers must stay undetected when inspecting the emblem. I put attackers in quote here because it's a bit of a funny attacker model. We are thinking about parties here who are willing to engage in offensive cyber operations, but not when their target has a digital emblem on it. These people must feel safe in using the digital emblem um, and trust that it doesn't harm the operations. For example, that, that it would reveal in other cases that they're about to attack entities. Coming to ADEM itself, we envision our design to be used by three types of parties. First, nation states who endorse protected parties, then protected parties who send out um, digital emblems to attackers. With ADEM, nation states can make sovereign decisions as to who they do or not endorse. Protected parties can distribute emblems autonomously, and this um, this touches on what Mauro said earlier. This is a means for protected parties to decide individually whether or not they want to decide, uh, whether or not they want to show the emblem, whether they or not they feel safe to showing it. ADEM was also designed as a plugin to the protected parties infrastructure. You can just add a device into their networks and it will distribute emblems for you. And for attackers, these parties can verify an emblem as authentic while staying undetected. And critically, we designed ADEM so that it also fits the standard workflow of attackers. Looking more at the technical sides of ADEM, we identify parties via domain names for countries, for example, via their .gov address and protected parties as well. For example, let's say pp.org. Governments and cryptographically endorse a protected party and a um, protected party, for example, would crypto cryptographically endorse a hospital that has some IP address. In practice, these hospitals have multiple protected digital assets, for example, a website, um, tablets of the medical staff or general purpose medical devices that cannot be touched as Mauro explained. 
With ADEM, you can deploy an emblem server additionally within the hospital that would signal protection via TLS, UDP, and DNS to aforementioned attackers. This emblem server would distribute emblems that have multiple parts. First, the emblem itself in the center, that is a cryptographically signed statement of protection, and this emblem would be accompanied by multiple endorsements. Endorsements from all the nation states that endorse the protected party and an endorsement from the protected party itself. An attacker could learn from this emblem that multiple conflicting states endorse the emblem and thus deem it as trustworthy. This reasoning might be simpler for military units who are bound by AHL. For these military units, it might suffice that they see that a nation state they trust, for example, their own nation state or an ally endorsed the emblem. In summary, our design ADEM provides three security requirements. It's verifiably authentic, it provides accountability, and it lets attackers stay undetected. Our design is to appear in a top tier security conference and our publication is accompanied by formal mathematical proofs of security. Currently, we have prototyping ongoing with the ICRC and we hope to deploy ADEM within the ICRC's network as I just showed for our hospital soon. If you want to learn more about the digital emblem, I encourage you to follow the QR code on the right hand side or reach out to me via my contact details and I look forward to the discussion later. Felix, thank you very much. And it is important to note that Felix and Francesca are dialing in uh, at approximately 4.30 a.m. their time. So real kudos to them and thank you for their generosity. Tony, I think has a slightly better time zone, but still up a little bit late. So turning to you, please, Tony, if we can hear your thoughts on uh, similar aspects as, as Felix's presentation, but from the perspective of Johns Hopkins APL. Thank you. Yes, happy to do that and happy to be here. Thank, thank you very much for um, for inviting us to this and also to participate in the um, larger effort. Um, uh, we, um, uh, the Applied Physics Lab, or division of the university, we, we have a variety of technical efforts, many focused on protecting critical infrastructure. The project um, we're discussing here is actually part of a, a broader set of activities we have, recognizing that while we are a laboratory, uh, major technology activities, uh, if we expect to have um, significant impact, have to be tied into a legal and uh, even a, a, a legal policy and even a social framework to be, um, to be successful. And so that's what this is about. We've had a longstanding effort to look beyond the technology into the other uh, policy, ethical, uh, uh, norms-based issues associated with um, critical infrastructure. And um, when we discussed with ICRC some of their objectives for the digital emblem, there's a significant overlap, particularly because within the context of international humanitarian law, we had a fairly specific way of thinking about what um, needed to be done in order to provide that emblem to the, um, the parties that needed to be able to implement it and observe it um, and, uh, uh, and respect it. So um, I'll tell you a little bit about what we envision for the um, technical solution, but I wanna back up a little bit to kind of our thoughts on what is it that a digital emblem has to do and this is uh, recapitulating a little bit of, of what we've heard, but I think the important thing to think about here is um, twofold. Who is it that has to respect the emblem and who is it that has to observe that, that set of behaviors? And it's important that we are looking at actors who would um, desire to comply with international humanitarian law. So there's a large class of cyber actors, a large class of cyber attacks. Uh, there, uh, hacktivists, uh, uh, cyber criminals, script kiddies who are doing it for fun. And then there are nation states or organized militaries or organized um, uh, combatants who employ cyber in conjunction uh, typically with other means of power. And those are the, um, the types of cyber operators we're focused on. Uh, that's the nature of the, of the emblem for inter international humanitarian laws. It, it applies to those types of actors. And one thing we observe is that if you look at how nation states have employed cyber means in conflict, um, they typically have fairly broad uh, capabilities 
and will do things like major disruptions to the internet in order to um, uh, support whatever it is that they would like to do, um, suppressing um, uh, uh, activity within their state or uh, limiting the ability of um, of uh, their uh, 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 of combatants to to um, operate within their um, domain. So what that means is, from a protection point of view, we can't just think about protecting the in systems, the data, the processing, we also have to be able to protect the communication. Many of the operations that um, we look to protect rely not just on the ability to process locally, but the ability to reach back and uh, communicate uh, either for logistics purposes, to uh, receive advice, receive supplies. So the emblem needs to protect both the end system, its data and processing, and the communications. and. The, it has to do that with a degree of assurance. It has to do that in a way that's visible to operators. And then to some of Francesca's points, it also has to be visible to third parties in a way that doesn't disrupt the operations of the humanitarian mission. So we were looking for a solution that had those kind of attributes. It needs to be scalable. It needs to be visible globally. And it can't be a burden on the operations of the uh, humanitarian organization beyond what they need to do in order to operate um, on the internet. And, and in order to do that, what we tried to do was look at how we would leverage the infrastructure that is in place in the internet, rather than looking at developing a new capability that would require new infrastructure. And what we were looking at was the way to uh, leverage what is on the internet today in order to secure the internet. Uh, the um, internet technology has grown the capability to employ cryptographic methods to protect the fundamental uh, uh, data that you need to operate the internet. And that is the naming and the addressing that's used in order to enable communications. <clears throat> so with, with that infrastructure in place, we have an asset that we can use that doesn't require us to roll out new capability in support of the emblem. We leverage what's out there that gives us uh, the global uh, reach and the scale that we think we need. And a lot of these technologies are well understood. What we have to understand is how to adapt it into this mission, into the mission of, of supporting a digital emblem. And the fundamental problem, you know, in our, in our opinion, isn't the um, technology to protect information on the internet or to, or to indicate uh, your presence on the internet. Uh, protecting IP addresses, protecting names as established technologies. What needs to be done is adapting it into the model for how uh, international humanitarian law and the emblem are used. And there's a very strong analogy with what's done physically. And I think we've touched on some of this. The emblem is understood globally through the good work of the um, International Committee of the Red Cross and the national societies, but the um, the emblem itself is uh, uh, regulated under the laws of each state. And so it's different in each state. And what has to be done then is to tie the assurance that the emblem is valid to that authority that the state has to determine how to regulate the use of the emblem, which is different in different states. In some places, uh, there's a very close coupling to the national societies. In other places, there are state agencies that are responsible for regulating the emblem. But that's the new connection that has to be made from a technology point of view. And that is all about the ability to use the same cryptographic techniques that are used to protect the internet, but to protect the emblem. Now, that's um, uh, the premise for what we're doing. Let me talk specifically about what we think uh, would would uh, be a valid implementation of the emblem that has these properties of global visibility and scalability. What we've looked at doing is simply leveraging what's already in place for secure naming, secure DNS, and for routing, for securing the BGP system used for global routing. And what that means is that we have cryptographic protection for that information, for names and addresses. How do we now layer on top of that the cryptographic protection for the emblem? Well, to do that, we can leverage what's available already within DNS. And we have a prototype running where what we have done 
is taken part of our DNS namespace at um, JHU and um, as part of our demonstration said that that subset of the namespace is for humanitarian missions. Now, the name itself isn't the emblem because the name is not something that can easily be assured. But what we do in addition to assuring the name, which shows that the name is legitimate, we insert within the DNS record a special text record that is signed by a different entity that is trusted to verify that the emblem is being used properly. And that's what then has to be tied back to the way international humanitarian law is regulated in the different states uh, and the different, in the different jurisdiction. So that's the first part of what we've suggested, that we use uh, the DNS in order to propagate this information, make that available within the DNS record using standard technology, thereby inheriting the scalability and global reach. But it's not enough to have names. In order to see what's happening on the internet, you actually have to focus on addresses and you get an address from the namespace. But if you just relied on that, you'd run into the problem of being able to do that at scale. If you are the, um, uh, you know, if you are Francesca's organization, you don't want to have to look for each individual name and collect each individual address. What you'd like to do is operate in a way where the addresses used for these protected missions are part of a distinguished part of the IP address space. And again, that's something that can be done. It is used all the time in order to segregate um, some of the traffic for the normal users of the internet, uh, commercial internet operators, uh, uh, nation states that operate the internet will distinguish how they handle traffic based on what they know about the meaning of that address, but they do that based on local config uh, considerations. What we're seeking to do is make that um, context by which you determine how to handle an address global and global tied to international humanitarian law. So the suggestion then is to have um, designated blocks of addresses that are associated with humanitarian missions and assigned through the normal process to provision internet services tied to this, the infrastructure in place for secure routing. What that means is an entity that would like to have a service supporting a humanitarian mission would number that out of, out of the address space that is designated for humanitarian missions and register that within the RPKI, the resource public key in, index that exists for routing and thereby gain the global scaling and visibility for the address so that if an entity like the Cyber Peace Institute would like to see if internet traffic disruptions are affecting humanitarian um, uh, traffic flows, that is done based on aggregated blocks of addresses so that it's quickly visible to a third party observer that a state action has in fact affected a humanitarian mission. So those are the core, core technical concepts. Adopt the naming um, technology and the means to do secure naming in order to uh, uh, provide a um, uh, a distinguished record that serves as the namespace address and rely on blocks of addresses in order to have uh, traffic flows that can be monitored that are associated with humanitarian missions. All of that secured by standard cryptographic techniques that then need to be tied to essentially a root of trust associated with the way that international humanitarian law is implemented. That last piece really is where we see, excuse me a second, That last piece is where we see a great opportunity to work with um, international organizations on how that would be done. If it's done country by country, we again have a scalability problem. Uh, every country would have to be able to, uh, every country, not just every country, everyone interested in participating would have to essentially touch every country. Better would be to work through existing organizations, um, national societies and the ICRC or the IFRC, or perhaps um, regional associations that countries might use in order to uh, coordinate how they would implement the regulation of the entity that they do under their domestic laws. Um, that piece, again, is at the intersection of the technical solution that I've, that I've sketched out here and the legal policy uh, frameworks that are in place to allow cooperation among nations and then a cooperation with third-party entities. 
So that's where we are. And as I mentioned, what we're doing now is prototyping focused not on showing you can do this. Like I say, most of this is very well established technologies, but showing that if you do it on the operational internet, it will behave the way you expect. It will have the scaling properties, the global visibility. We will have the ability to um, bring up or take down an emblem. We have to understand what those time constants are given the way the internet works. And that's an experiment that we hope to do over the next, uh, over the next few months with some technical partners. And in parallel to that, as I say, we should be doing some work with uh, the appropriate bodies that would look at how the nations that are responsible for putting in place regulation of the, of, of the use of the emblem would cooperate in order to make the assurance of the emblem something that also scales globally. And that's what I have. Thank you. Tony, thank you very much. I think both yourself and Felix, your remarks have highlighted the uh, technical feasibility of the emblem. And of course, uh, that in itself demonstrates the uh, innovative nature of the emblem itself. And also, I think, speaks to the credit of the ICRC for taking so much time to go through the due diligence to identify and design how this could be rolled out in practice. In the next 15, 20 minutes, we have the privilege of engaging in uh, what I hope to be a dynamic conversation among the speakers, and that will delve into the technical policy, cybersecurity, and humanitarian aspects surrounding the digital emblem. This is intended to be a conversation among the speakers so that they all have a chance to react to and build upon each other's thoughts. And if I can please request for the AV team to have Antonio uh, Felix and Francesca on the screen at the same time so that you can see them simultaneously. Uh, that'll be very helpful. Thank you. So let's start by discussing the, uh, I suppose, a mix of technological and policy uh, dimensions of the digital emblem. I think it's crucial to consider the involvement of international organizations such as ICANN and the ITU in this endeavor. I wonder if any speakers have any thoughts on how these organizations can play a role in the development and uh, implementation of the emblem and what collaborative efforts we can envision on this front. Felix, I think maybe you have some thoughts on this topic. Yeah, this touches a bit on what uh, Tony said last time. Um, so we, in our design of Adam, we feature a notion of authorities as well. Um, and we are deliberately vague in what these authorities are supposed to be uh, because we don't know which authorities like the world in the end will agree upon which are the, the good ones to be endorsed by. So um, one of these authorities could be the ICSC that endorses protected parties to run humanitarian missions. It could also be organizations like ICANN. But what we thought is that organizations that for example, um, control parts of the naming system of the internet are not particularly well suited to verify whether someone that reaches out to them and tells them, hey, um, I, w I run a protected mission, can you please endorse me? Organizations that are more of technical nature would have a hard time verifying these requests as genuine is what we feared. So we didn't want to put any legal burdens on technical organizations, so to speak, and rather focused on nation states or maybe supranational organizations like the Arab League or um, organizations that know what they're doing in the space anyways, like the ICRC. Thank you, Felix. Do any other speakers have thoughts on this? Probably just a yeah, word. I, uh, I'm sorry, Tony, go ahead. Tony, then please. I, I um, that, um, I, I, I agree with Felix that the, the, um, it's really the regional registries more than I can. They are responsible for operations, but their role is the validity of the information used to run the internet. They are not in general in a position to verify a humanitarian organization, but that's not true as a blanket statement. And the difference is it is a state responsibility as, as the ICRC has written to regulate the use of the emblem. And in many states, there is a very close coupling between the internet operator and the state. And so in that world, under the ICANN and the regional registries, there is a state authority that controls names and numbers. And if that's the case, then there's a natural place for that to be the authority that controls the use of the emblem, not as the numbering authority, but as the state authority for the use of the internet. Now that's not global. In the United States, that's not the way the internet operates. In the United States, 
The government has very little involvement in how names and numbers are, are allocated, but in other countries, uh, Egypt, for example, China, the coupling is very close. For, so, for, uh, so the answer, uh, Michael, to your question is not simple. In some places, you'd expect a close coupling. In other places, it really needs to be distinct, but it does need to be tied into the way that the internet itself is operated, or you have to overlay another global scalable system, for example. So uh, we envision using DNS, not to use DNS to verify that the emblem is correct, but to use DNS to propagate the emblem regardless of who uh, has signed the digital record within the DNS record that says the emblem is valid. That can be an ISP, as I say, in, in certain countries. In the United States, it almost certainly would not be. It could be the American Red Cross or it could be the U.S. as part of the uh, a, a transnational, a, a supranational uh, organization, but the 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 general technical solution does have to maintain that separation, recognizing that operationally to make this scalable, it does have to couple to what's done by the registries and ICANN. Thank you, Tony. Maro. Yeah, just to uh, give a couple more thoughts on uh, on the legal and policy perspective. So, the use of the emblem is not. Uh, is not decided by the ICRC. So this is decided by states uh, on the Geneva Convention. So, and, and this is in the Annex 1 uh, and the, and, uh, of, the, of the additional protocol. So that's where we have to operate from a legal perspective. So um, bind to the um, uh, technological development, we are working on the, on the legal process and uh, we are presenting the idea to states so that uh, for the international conference in October 2024 where the states gonna come to Geneva to also to discuss about the emblem uh, states are uh, aware about the project and national societies too and then they we, we we look for them to give us the mandate to continue to explore uh, this this project because at the end of the day we have to amend uh, the Geneva Convention, so we have to amend uh, the additional protocol or to create a new protocol. So this is the, the basic legal process that we have to go through uh, to be able to have a, a digital version of the emblem. So that said, in the offline physical space, then are the state's authority that decide uh, who is able to uh, use the emblem. So the Ministry of Health or, or other ministries entitled for this, they decide who internally in, the, in, the, in, in their nation or in their territory, because we are also talking about a non-state actor that uh, occupy territory and control territory, so this uh, could be also a non-state actor. They are entitled to uh, mm, give the permission to uh, selected entities to display the emblem uh, for protection, so the distinctive use it's already in the in the Geneva Convention, so the ICRC and the, and the the national societies. But at the end of the day, the entity that decide who is able to display the emblem in the physical space is the state. So we try to replicate the same uh, the same process that we have in the offline, also in the online. We're gonna see. Uh, the difficulties uh, that uh, we can have in, in this in this specific uh, uh, domain, but uh, we we would like to replicate exactly the same the same process for the authorization. Then the implementation is uh, another uh, is another topic. But uh, yeah, thank you, Mauro. Very helpful. Let's turn to the cybersecurity implications because, of course, we must recognize that with innovation comes great responsibility. And so let's examine the risks and benefits associated with this concept. I wonder if any speakers have any thoughts on potential vulnerabilities that we should be vigilant about. Uh, and of course, conversely, how the overall cybersecurity of uh, cybersecurity posture of critical medical and humanitarian organizations can be enhanced by the emblem, but also recognizing that in a world where cyber threats evolve, and sometimes in predictable ways, sometimes in unpredictable ways, what proactive and best practices can we put in place to safeguard these vital systems? Would anyone like to start? Kochiro, please. So uh, I, I don't have a clear answer for the question, but to protect the, or, well, talking about the protecting the, uh, for example, infrastructure at the hospital or medical, 
uh, medical system. Um, so this is more like a question to Felix or Antonio. Um, you, you mentioned the, the ADEM or the implementation, implementation of digital emblems right now is it can sign on DNS domain name or IP address or uh, TRS DNS. Could it be possible to sign like individual files or medical uh, the, the, the physical systems that are used in uh, factory or um, factory or hospitals? Felix, you have your hand up. Jump right in. Oh, yeah, great. Yeah, so uh, we need to distinguish two types of, of two parts of ADEM. Just talking about my design now, um, or our design. So there is, for one, what you say that is protected, right? Like how you speak about the entities that are protected, in which direction you point. And what we use in ADEM are IP addresses and domain names for that, right? This is how we identify an entity that is protected. And then TLS and UDP and DNS are our mechanisms by which we give someone the emblem, right? And then this emblem includes the pointer that's a, like we give it via, for example, UDP, and then this emblem says, ah, it, this is the protected IP address, this is the protected domain name. Now, a colleague of mine is currently working also on local emblems, where the idea is that um, malware that uh, infested some device could check whether this device is protected or whether parts of this device are protected. Uh, in the work that I presented, we focused on the network level and on the network level, we thought it only makes sense to talk about things that you can also see from the network level, right? Like we found it would be kind of like, what would a verifier do with the information? Oh, like, uh, looking at their notes, file file um, f.txt on this computer is protected allegedly, but I mean, I have no access to this computer, right? How, what am I supposed to do with this information? Yeah. So on the internet, we wanted um, people to only say something is protected that they can also recognize as that thing that is protected. But for local emblems, we are looking on future work, yeah. And this, for example, would target especially the devices of medical staff because not every penetration happens through the network layer, right? It could be malware in a malicious email attachment that just gets sent out en masse, right? And then the malware happens to find itself wake up within a hospital network. And we want, also want to um, cater those designs or those problems rather, not designs. Oh, thank, thank you, that's clear. So, so um, like, uh, could, we make, could I make one comment on, on in, uh, the, some of the risks? We, we worried a bit about unintended consequences and um, what we have to be careful of is not to create an emblem in a way that itself potentially causes a disruption to the humanitarian mission. And really the important thing here is to think about how a third party, not the cyber actor, how a third party would uh, observe that um, the emblem was being respected. What we wanted to avoid was depending on the humanitarian organization itself to field a query from an arbitrary third party in order to avoid the potential for an unexpected, uh, an unintended denial of service attack. So the scenario to think about is you would like to be able to observe a cyber attack in progress if the only way to do that is to query the attacked entity what you are doing is focusing traffic on the attacked entity. That's how unintended denial of service happens. So there's no way to check for malware on a machine without checking the machine. But given what we have seen, that nation state attacks typically are focused more on the infrastructure than on the individual user, we want to make sure that the Observe, observation of attacks on the infrastructure don't depend on observing the endpoint. And I'm, I'm uh, talking about a set of mechanisms that have actually manifested many times on the internet. 
with the loss of certain critical capabilities because of um, a focused overload on the endpoint. You can imagine that kind of thing happening if all the news organizations in the world or all of the third parties that care to monitor um, compliance with uh, international humanitarian law address a uh, endpoint that is intended to be protected. So that's a little aspect of this that is uh, still of concern to me. Our solution tends to tries to mitigate that by relying on internet infrastructure to query for third parties, but there's nothing that prevents those third parties from actually now that they know where, where the uh, uh, attack is, is manifesting from actually uh, focusing their attention on it unintentionally disabling the humanitarian operation. Thank you, Tony. Kochiro? Just, just a very quick comment, but uh, so I, I do agree with, um, well, or I, I strongly believe that the local emblem is something uh, we, we really need uh, to implement this concept because uh, the, 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 the more a system is critical is, uh, you know, those systems tend to be uh, completely offline or not, connect, not connected or uh, you know, doesn't use the uh, global IP address spaces, uh, do not associate with any domain name and, and others. So um, that's, that's something uh, I need to see your future proposal. Thank you, Coach Hiro. Francesca, if I may put you on the spot at 5 a.m. your time, I know strategic foresight is a speciality of yours. I wonder if you have any thoughts on where risks to the medical and humanitarian sector might go in the future and how we can proactively mitigate those risks. Well, actually, can I, can, can I share a reflection uh, that uh, was, uh, I think, a, a sort of like connection point uh, um, across uh, different uh, um, uh, aspects that were mentioned, starting from what uh, Mauro was mentioning in terms of like uh, one of the key requirement of the um, of the emblem is that it needs to be understandable by the different parties. Let's say, and 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 let me um, share specifically also to to address your point, Michael, in terms of like uh, which are the evolutions in cyberspace that uh, that we are seeing. And uh, I'm sharing an evolution that uh, we are all aware about, for example, the kind of like civilianization often of, 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 of conflict, for example, that we've seen and why the emblem is so relevant. So more than an evolution in terms of like a technology, I'm, I'm, I would like to share um, uh, an evolution, which is a combination of, uh, um, uh, let's say, technological disruption, like, for example, the availability of, uh, of certain tools and and I'm thinking for example about the accessibility of harmful and sophisticated malware for example the the diffusion of ready to use the cyber tools that are accessible online leaked or sold and and so they they lowers the barriers of entry for malicious actors one of the um the of the key elements that uh, uh, that Mauro mentioned before is that the emblem needs to be understandable also by the attackers and uh, here we've been talking more about let's say the uh, the technological vulnerability but let's also think about the human vulnerabilities let's say in terms of uh, um, lowering the barrier to entry means also that again as we've seen um, the let's say there is a blurring line between the state and non-state actors um, the uh, complexity, clearly, of the, um, uh, I mean, the, the attribution of, of cyber attacks and the increased complexity of having um, uh, civilians, for example, um, engaging in cyber operations. This to say that um, one of the problem is also understanding uh, um, the real impact that certain action might have uh, um we what we have observed is uh, for example uh that uh, there is a combination between uh, for example uh, uh state sponsored actors uh, and uh, activist collectives that usually conduct more basic uh, attacks and focus on, on disruptive effects but you can never um completely let's say foresee the, the spillover effect or without fully understanding the consequences that uh, their actions might have, uh, often because they they don't understand the full impact, uh, basically, that they might have uh, with their actions. So 
Um, I, I, I think this is an, an interesting evolution, let's say, in cyberspace, where, again, to um, tomorrow's point in terms of like the uh, the value of the um, of the digital emblem is uh, um, is indeed something to to consider. And and let me also allow another another comment, which was also. Um, um, I, I was seeing some of the of the comments in the chat uh, about the education. I think that the education needs to go in in different directions. Um, again, uh, going back to why it's important, let's say, to protect um, uh, healthcare um, um, uh, organizations, institutions, and facilities, uh, but also at the same time, uh, humanitarian organizations. Um, before understanding, uh, let's say, why it's important to protect, is uh, um, often the uh, easier argument is uh, to offer uh, concrete examples of what it means if we're not protecting them. And we've seen this. Uh, we have not necessarily learn learned from that, but this needs to go across, uh, let's say, the different stakeholders involved. I started with the malicious actors, but then let me go back also to uh, what the, um, let's say, uh, which are, le let's say, the um, the ones that needs to decide on the emblem, as Mauro was mentioning, uh, are states at the end of the day. Um, also, in terms of like states, we need to educate in terms of uh, uh, which are the real consequences and the real impact of, uh, of attacks. And uh, to, to this end, uh, uh, one of the work that, uh, that, that, that we're currently doing is uh, um, also analyzing, basically starting exactly with the work that I was mentioning on the healthcare, um, to understand uh, the real human impact, but also to foresee potential consequences on the long term. Uh, we started doing this work by which we are um, working on a standardized methodology to measure the societal harm from cyber attack and monitor also the responsible behavior in cyberspace and to, and, uh, and to the points that, uh, that have been made. Um, um, this needs to be applicable in peacetime, in uh, in armed conflict time, and be able to um, assess which are the costs that we are paying as society if we are not um, protecting um, vital infrastructure like healthcare and humanitarian organizations. Francesca, thank you very much. We now have approximately 22 minutes for audience Q&A. For anyone in the room who has a question, if you could please approach the microphone at the stand. Uh, I don't say that to make things awkward, but just it is important for accessibility and so that uh, questions are, are uh, captioned on the screen as well. Uh, but just to help kick things off, there is a, a question uh, in the Q&A chat on Zoom, which I'll pose. It's, it's actually a very helpful big picture question, then we can zoom back in. And the question comes from Aliyu Shabashi. They ask, can we stop cyber attacks in all sectors by investing a huge amount of funds for developing highly sophisticated software tools slash systems? Or are there other means to at least minimize cyber attacks that harm countries? It's a big picture question, not just specific to the uh, digital emblem. It helps us expand the conversation on cybersecurity more broadly. If any of the other speakers have thoughts on this, I'll just quickly mention sort of the Microsoft perspective. At Microsoft, we talk about five specific actions which are recommended. Uh, that uh, are, are taken. One, this is true for individuals and systems administrators, is to apply multi-factor authentication. I know that can sometimes seem very annoying, but it does make an enormous difference, as studies have shown. Secondly, apply zero trust principles. That's specific to uh, systems administrators. Extend detection uh, and uh, anti-malware software and solutions. Keep up to date, in other words, patch systems and use the latest uh, uh, available versions of software and protect data ideally through encryption. And studies have shown that 99% of cyber attacks can be stopped by those basic cyber hygiene activities. We'll also encourage uh, tech and telco companies to join the Cybersecurity Tech Accord, which is a coalition of approximately 150 members who have committed to best practices and principles uh, of responsible behavior in cyberspace, as well as the Paris Call for Trust and Security in Cyberspace, which actually applies to all sectors, uh, and it's the largest multi-stakeholder initiative to advance uh, cyber resilience, and would encourage uh, anyone to engage with Francesca's organization, the Cyber Peace Institute. But does anyone else have any thoughts on this? Francesca, I see your hand is up. 
I, I was waiting for this moment <laughs> because uh, actually when uh, when we when we um worked on uh, on the um uh, on the cyber incident to trace our health um in, in in full transparency we started receiving many requests like can you do it also for the banking sector for example um can you do it also for other um uh vital infrastructure on purpose uh, we uh, decided to focus on all civilian infrastructure and so we started looking in, into that so um i get the point uh, so I, i'm i'm talking here more about like uh, understanding the full landscape. I'm not going to go into the weeds, let's say, of the uh, definitions and uh, let's say the in the, in the landscape of uh, um, uh, different laws and regulations that apply that are making also difficult, let's say, uh, to do some 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 proper collection work. But uh, let's stick to uh, to our own experience and to answer to the question. Uh, would the funding be enough uh, from a technical standpoint? Uh, and I, I spent all my life in cybersecurity. I would say no. Uh, stopping, <laughs> let's say, cyber attacks worldwide, uh, not possible. But um, on the mitigation side, uh, indeed, uh, there's uh, there, there's work that uh, that can be done. Um, you mentioned um, uh, you started basically already answering, Michael, in in mentioning. I mean. Uh, uh, basic cyber hygiene, and and to me, this should be kind of like the um, uh, the, uh, the, the 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 minimum requirements, so let's say, uh, of uh, um, all society education. But uh, sticking more in terms of like what the different stakeholders can do, um, I think there is there is one basic point which is. Uh, um, full cooperation in terms of like information sharing. One of the challenges that we encountered, for example, in uh, um, in, in, in the uh, cyber incident tracer health was to collect the data, analyze the data, and, and, and also share the data among the different partners. So information sharing is still a challenge. Um, and uh, um, there is one part which is also related to then how to transform the knowledge into let's say palatable and and, and understandable <laughs> um, um, knowledge uh, that can help uh, the international community to advance the mitigation efforts uh, uh, notably when it comes to for example accountability but also um, i'm thinking in terms of like uh, um, the um, uh, the active role that civil society organization or non-state actors michael you mentioned the the the, the tech accord for example or civil society organization like us and like many other um, attendees, for example, the IGF and, and, and for sure in the room uh, can play a role because they are the ones that are often either impacted or they are the last mile, let's say, very close to the people that are impacted by, by cyber attacks. So to understand, again, the consequences and for uh, potentially advancing uh, knowledge for the mitigation efforts, uh, we need to have this constant dialogue and then the third part uh, um, that we have not discussed so much uh, um, about, but uh, in the end, it's also, um, uh, I mean, the, the the framing of the of the conversation, which is protecting the protectors, meaning sharing also defense resources, because there is one part which is the information sharing when it comes to the attacks, but then there is also okay, so what we can do about it, and therefore how we can mitigate, enhancing. Um, a cyber capacity building. There are different efforts uh, in, in in that regard. I would like to mention there there is going to be um, 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 a high level meeting uh, in uh, in in Ghana um, at the end of November. The Global Cyber Capacity Building Conference. I'm mentioning this because this goes also into the mitigation effort side, and uh, there will be also one focus specifically on uh, on protection of critical infrastructure. Uh, both in, uh, let's say, I would say, developed and in, the, in in developing countries, but then also again sharing uh, the um, the knowledge, the the good practices, and also sharing active, uh, let's say, um, defense initiatives uh, um, to this end. Uh, and considering the humanitarian context, we launched the uh, humanitarian cybersecurity center, which is a sort of like um, umbrella platform by which we are collaborating with different entities exactly to go. I mean, hopefully to stop cyber attacks, but especially to mitigate uh, the um, the impact of cyber attacks, specifically on humanitarian organizations, because they are the ones, again, that they are uh, protecting society as a whole. Thank you, Francesca. Tony, your hand is up. 
Yeah, I um, just wanted to first, Michael, very much endorse your points <clears throat> about the importance of some basic cyber hygiene. Many, many of the kinds of attacks you see that are very damaging, we have the technology to mitigate it, it's just not done. Um, having said that, um, I think we can't count on a technology solution to these problems because some of the um, adversaries are so sophisticated, some of the targets are so valuable that there has to be more than a technical solution. And that's one of the things you know, that got us started down this path. We think there's a lot of value to um, exposing malicious behavior and looking for collective action, which is one of the reasons why we've tied a lot of the mechanisms we've used specifically for the um, IHL application to general mechanisms available on the internet because IHL is very important but very limited to the humanitarian operations in conflict. So you want to have a solution that works in that environment, but you'd like to be able to extend it under different authorities into other environments. And authorities could be legal authorities or could just be um, uh, ethical or uh, norm-based behavior that says we will be able to observe that there seems to be hostile activity against a hospital, not in conflict, a hospital, or a public utility. And to do that, you have to make, you have to provide some more transparency so those who are interested in watching know what they're seeing. And again, to do that, to do that globally and scalable, you have to tie it to um, the scalable infrastructure that's in place. You can't hope to do that sector by sector and still scale. Um, and you know that's one of our motivations to try to tie what we're doing to the infrastructure that's in place that can then be repurposed for these purposes. IHL, very good special case, but would not address, for example, uh, ransomware at a hospital in peacetime. That's not an IHL problem, but it's very much an important problem that could be solved by looking for those same kinds of bad behaviors. Tony, thank you very much. Again, in terms of questions in the room, please do approach the microphone, which is on that side uh, to my right, if you're looking at the screen. Yasmin, I believe you have a question, please. Um, hi, um, it's a bit awkward to be standing in, in, in front of a microphone, but thank you very much for this um, very interesting and fascinating panel. I'm, um, I'm Yasmin, I'm a researcher at the UN Institute for Disarmament Research. Um, so I do have a few questions, so I hope please bear, in mind, um, uh, um, bear with me. Uh, first on the question of um, offensive cyber capabilities that are being enhanced by AI. I know that there's a lot of hype around it, but fact is that there will be cyber capabilities that are increasing in speed even without um, automation and AI. And I was wondering how the digital emblem solutions would deal with issues surrounding, you know, the need for, for the emblem to be verifiable and, you know, in, in a, in, um, in, an, an, in an authentic way, but at the same time, how do you deal with the increase of speed of the cyber capabilities that might not even take the time to verify the authenticity of, this, of these emblems, or even they don't even care about the emblems in a way. Um, and second is the, my question of surrounding the appetite of states um, and sort of state, sub-state level uh, organizations and agencies for these um, for the solution, so obviously I've heard a lot about um, your efforts at socializing the idea, which I think is great, but at the same time, how much appetite do you see concretely at the moment, and what sort of in incentivization have worked so far? Because um, I saw, I, I think it was just yesterday, or a couple of days ago, I saw an article about, for example, the hacktivists in Russia and Ukraine who actually pledged to sort of lower, like, descale, there's the, the, you know, the level of cyber operations that they're conducting. But at the same time, how would you incentivize, for example, hacktivists that are less organized than these groups um, to respect solutions such as the digital emblem? Um, and yeah, I think that's about it, because right, I'm aware of them. Yasmin, thank you very much. I know we have more questions, and so it would be good if we can have the questions bunched together and then allow the panelists to respond in whatever makes most sense for them. So another question, please. Sure, so um, hello, my name is Gwyn Glasser. I'm actually with uh, the Cyber Peace Institute. Hi, Francesca. But we don't work directly together, so I'm not a plant. 
Um, my question actually follows on quite well from this last one about uh, incentives. I'm wondering, given um, problems around attribution that Francesca mentioned, uh, would you foresee kind of fewer uh, state actors being motivated to respect the emblem given that there's maybe an easier or, or a higher probability that they could, uh, the emblem could be violated without the attack being attributed to a state? That's my question, thank you. Thank you. And it looks like we have a third question. Hello, thank you very much everyone. This has been really interesting. I didn't actually know about this proposal. Um, I'm Jess Woodall and I work in policy and national security for Telstra, which is Australia's incumbent ISP and telco provider. So it's been really fascinating. And I have a background in international relations, so it was really, this really hit me. A um, couple of kind of observations and then uh, a question. Um, I think just, just to kind of add to what kind of Sparky was saying, um, I think there's, there's a real kind of need for this. Like we have excellent kind of visibility on the targeting in the Asia Pacific region, given our kind of network and this is a real threat this is stuff that is happening now there's hospitals being hit by nation states that we can see kind of almost every day so there's i you know from the outset say there's a case for this and it's it's, it's really interesting um i think to kind of answer the question before my question um <laughs> the, the first question uh, you what i think you might see is like the the malicious kind of criminal community is very self-regulating so they will go after people who target people that they perceive as soft targets like they don't they don't like that amongst their own community so whilst this is kind of primarily targeted at nation states you might even see that trickle down impact within the the criminal community itself so yeah i think that there might be broader kind of impacts than than what you've even outlined here um on the kind of issue of validating kind of who is adhering to to the emblem because i'm a real kind of you know how do we implement this this is great but what will it look like in reality like how do we roll it out how do we do it you could you could even look to isps because we can see we have really good knowledge of who the key nation states are that are operating in our jurisdictions what their c2s are what their infrastructure is so if you were to implement something like this you could reach out to kind of those organizations and be like, okay, is this actually being adhered to? Are, are people following these kind of rules? And we could give you kind of some insight, you know, is that happening or is that not happening? So yeah, my question is like, do you think that there's kind of a role for, you know, ISPs and that kind of situation to help validate that people are adhering to, you know, an emblem type um, scenario? Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Jess. Tremendously helpful. So just to briefly summarize there, we've had a question on how to deal with the implications of AI-empowered attacks, but also AI-empowered defense, the, the appetite for states here, and, and similarly how we can ensure that states respect the emblem, uh, how do we think about knock-on consequences of the emblem, and the role for ISPs. We have approximately six minutes left, so if I could encourage our speakers to exercise some brevity, that would be great. Who would like to go first? Felix, I see your hand is up. Yes, I, I hope I can be brief. I'll do my best. Um, so I actually would like to uh, comment on all of the um, questions or parts of them. So in the context of the question regarding AI, it was asked like, how do we then even deal with attackers who might not uh, even verify the emblem as authentic? And here I think it's important to recontextualize the emblem. Um, so the emblem is a mechanism that aims to reduce cyber attacks, but only by design from those people who verify it and pay respect to it. So I think it's important in all discussion to focus just on these actors, because otherwise there is no point and there's nothing we can do. Um, regarding the last question, I, I appreciate that the second question was already answered <laughs> by the uh, person asking the question themselves. Um, if, a role that we were exploring for our design in general, not um, regarding ISPs, was because our design is is so active, it, it functions like a heartbeat protocol, right? Um, emblems are just sent out regularly or not. Uh, we were wondering if monitors that regularly, but not too often, check whether these emblems are actually sent out to be able to attest, for example, to other people. No, I mean, you say you didn't see the emblem, but look, we saw how it was sent out. It was not dropped. 
Um, and I've never thought of ISPs taking this role, but um, it could be one of the possible roles. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Felix. Four minutes remaining. Who would like to go next, Maro? Yeah, probably on the non-state actor and, uh, and, uh, and the incentive for, uh, for the state actor to respect the evidence. So from the state's perspective, so there is a, a, a legislation that they, they, they signed or are the convention, so they should comply with the, with the Geneva Conventions if they're going to sign this uh, amendment or the new protocol. So they are bind by law. Uh, knowing that in cyberspace you can be a little bit more anonymous than in the physical one when you do operation, it's, it's one thing. We have to test the emblem when it's going to be uh, out there. But uh, we tend to think that uh, um, countries that are respecting the, the physical emblem will also be uh, 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 in respect of the digital one. Another story is about the non-state actors. So we published a couple of days ago on the European Journal, uh, journal of, of uh, International Law an article about uh, eight rules that non-state actors should uh, respect. Uh, um, those are n not new rules. So, so some newspaper mm, thought that uh, we are doing a new Geneva Convention or, or, or new commandments in this respect. Those, those are just rules based on IHL, so rooted on IHL. And uh, we call non-state actors to respect IHL. We formulate in a little bit new way because, uh, uh, because of the, the recent uh, uh, um, conflicts, but those rules are uh, rooted in IHL. So what, what is the goal is to talk to, uh, uh, through the publication of this rule, to talk to those non-state actors and to ask them to respect IHL and not to, to attack civilian objects and not to attack civilian people and so on and so on. So you can find this on our blog and uh, on, uh, on the European uh, uh, Journal. So through this uh, work we are doing, we are teaching those people what is IHL, what is the respect of IHL, and then an infringement of IHL could be considered as a war crime. So this is what we, what we try to do. We do in the physical space with the armed forces, and now we try to do also on uh, a digital space, knowing that the people in the digital space are physically somewhere. So that's, that's the goal. Thank you, Maro. Two minutes remaining. Would anyone like to be the final speaker for this session? If not, then sure, I'll help to wrap up. Uh, you don't need me to reiterate the significance and or importance of protecting medical facilities and humanitarian organizations. Uh, we know that. I think this session has helped demonstrate how we further help those sectors to be protected. But of course, uh, as we've also discussed, technical solutions are not enough. We need a broad range of uh, multidimensional solutions involving many, many actors. And so I hope that those of you here who have joined us in the room or online have found that this has been relevant to your work and that you can also contribute in ways that are, are necessary. Of course, Mara will be uh, here and of course feel free to, to email or connect to any one of us uh, if it is uh, necessary to do so. Uh, I think we clearly need to have more collaboration but also there's a space for more research and more advocacy on these matters as well. This session alone doesn't achieve all those goals. But with that, I'd like to thank our great speakers for what I hope has been an interesting session and thank our attendees as well for their tremendous engagement and questions. Thank you all very much. Thank you.